Live from downtown Detroit, Local 4 News at 6 starts now. Making a statement. The prosecution in the Whitmer kidnap plot trial using the defendant's own voices to illustrate the alleged plot and the anger that was fueling it. Series of chilling recordings played in federal court today as opening statements got underway. Yeah, but the defense team says the four men on trial were just talking big and under the influence of recreational drugs when they chatted about storming the governor's property and kidnapping her. Local four defender Sean Lay is live with what was in those recordings and what we learned from the first witnesses that were called today, Sean. Fascinating first day of this trial, Kimberly and Devin, and you're right. It was all about voice recordings of the defendants themselves, clearly stating that they were going to go to war with the government. Federal prosecutors using the defendants own voices as key evidence on day one of testimony in the Whitmer kidnapping trial. Federal prosecutors playing recordings of defendant Adam Fox, Fox calling Governor Whitmer a tyrant and how he wanted to start a second civil war. One recording played for the jury, quote, I am ready to give maximum effort. I will fire the first shot. The only way brute force violence is the only way to get our rights back. Another recording from Fox, quote, we have the numbers, we have the arms, we have the strategy to take our country back. Prosecutors call defendant Barry Croft a dangerous anti-government extremist, urging members of the Wolverine Watchmen to use violence against what he saw was an overreaching state government. One recording from Croft was played, quote, we are ready to go to war. I don't like violence, but when it is at our door, it is that. I can't wait to eat these like animal crackers. They do not know the wrath they provoke. While defense attorneys argue the men on trial were all talk, more recordings were played in court. Croft again, quote, we need to topple these tyrants. Some of the recordings were voicemail, some were sent over Facebook. Comments about attacking government officials were also recorded by confidential informants within the Wolverine Watchman group. The very first witness on the stand today, an FBI agent who is investigating this group, also receiving those recordings from a confidential informant. Tomorrow, another FBI agent takes the witness stand with more of these new allegations that are new details coming forward. Kimberly Devin, back to you. And this is just the beginning. Sean, we appreciate it. Well, the pain at the pump stings a little more each day, doesn't it? Michigan drivers paying an average of $4.24 a gallon. Uh, it's actually a, a penny less than the national average, but that's a little consolation. Republican state lawmakers passed a House bill today that would put a six-month pause on the Michigan the state gas tax. They plan to send the proposal to Governor Whitmer next week. If she would approve it, drivers would save about 27 cents a gallon. Governors also requested Congress suspend the federal gas tax that sits right now at 18 cents a gallon. Now, the people hurt most by rising gas prices are the ones whose livelihoods depend on driving. We're hearing from more of those people every day. Victor Williams live tonight in eCourse. Uh, Victor, some people getting close to making some tough decisions about their careers because of their, they're facing yes, these Kevin. huge prices. That's correct. Tough decisions indeed. We're over here at this gas station on Jefferson and Outer Drive and E-Course and gas has gone up in just the 10 cents or in just the time that we've been here. Gas has gone up 10 cents from 409 to 419. But if it's not one thing, it's another for many people struggling to make ends meet. But with these soaring gas prices, it's even tougher. Boy, this is ridiculous. Mm -hmm. In the other time it took me that $10 less to fill this thing up. Tishka's Moore operates as a medical transporter, getting patients from point A to point B. But lately, it's been harder with prices at the pumps skyrocketing. I told my boss, we got, we got to get a raise or something. Tishkas has to pay for his own gas, which makes it harder when most of his check now goes into the tank and what feels like a never-ending cycle. I was spending $200 a week just in gas. Now, it won't be about 250 or more. I ain't bringing home but four or five hundred dollars a week. I put most of that back in the gas tank. Times are already hard. I got two teenagers at home. Then my grand youngest grandson be at the house. Got to take care of him, feed him, because he little fella. Yet Tishkis is remaining optimistic. Can't do nothing but roll with the punches. Get it out of here. The same frustrations could be felt with Jonathan Lord, who knows many people now affected by the steep rise. And it's a family right now down the street right now. They forced to, uh, to use the uh, public uh, mopeds right now because they can't afford the gas prices. It's 409, that's half of half of someone's wages. So 
We really need to get it together, get these uh, gas prices uh, down. And that's something that really stuck with us. Four dollars, the gas of price being half of someone's wages. As far as Mr. Tishkis goes, we're told that his employer may start giving out gas cards in the amount of fifty dollars per week. And of course, Victor Williams, local four. All right, Victor, now for a little perspective here, it's even worse in Europe. Today, the price of gas there has gone up above two euros a liter, so that equates to uh, somewhere around $8 a gallon U.S. Filling up a compact car, costing people the equivalent of 100 U.S. dollars. Think about the Canadian side, by the way. They're close to $7, the equivalent of $7 a gallon, about a buck 83 last I saw a liter on the Canadian side. The Kremlin is accusing the United States of declaring a, quote, economic war against Russia after the U.S. initiated energy and fuel embargoes Tuesday. Meanwhile, Russian airstrikes destroyed a children's and maternity hospital in the port city of Mariupol. The children remain trapped in that rubble. The World Health Organization has verified 18 attacks on health facilities, health workers, and ambulances in Ukraine. Today, Ukraine renewed efforts to evacuate civilians from cities under siege, but the country has accused Russia of repeatedly violating temporary ceasefires. Many Ukrainians are preparing to defend their neighborhoods block by block. Volunteers are making checkpoints and barrier walls out of sandbags and wood. Lester Holt is on the ground with them and ahead at 630 on Nightly News. You'll hear from these everyday people preparing for a fight. They talk about how personal this is and how proud they are to stand up for themselves and for their families. Today's coronavirus update. We've received new numbers from the state just this afternoon. 1,739 new cases recorded over the past two days. So the average there, about 870 cases a day. 240 more deaths also being reported, 220 of those coming from a records review. The University of Michigan will make face masking optional for most indoor spaces on March 14th. But masks are still going to be required in classrooms and other instructional spaces. Masks will also remain required in patient care areas, uh, campus COVID-19 testing sites and on campus buses. In June, Birmingham Public Schools adopted a school year budget that had an estimated $1.58 million shortfall. Well, now they're saying it's actually a $14 million shortfall, and that has implications for people's property taxes. Megan Woods joins us live. And uh, Megan, how did the district all of a sudden figure this out? So the superintendent sent out a, med a message to parents at the end of February. In that message, they explain where that $11 million miscalculation came from. They're saying that it's from when they were working on that mid-year budget amendment. In that letter to parents, Superintendent Dr. Mbeka Roberson cited three main factors that caused the miscalculations. One, underestimations of salary and retirement calculations for 2021 to 2022 school year. Two, overestimation of student enrollment. And three, an overlevying of property taxes. That last one will result in credit to taxpayers. Also in that letter, the superintendent mentions what they're doing moving forward, like in January, the district brought on a CPA and retired assistant superintendent of finance to perform a thorough review and work with their auditors. Superintendent Roberson says, quote, already we have made significant strides toward mitigating the impact of this new budget reality for the current fiscal year through the utilization of one-time federal grants. The mid-year amendment budget numbers were presented to the school board March 1st. After that, the superintendent sent out another message to parents answering important questions. And when referring to the future, she says, quote, we are in our strategic planning process, which includes focus groups, community surveys and committees that include a broad variety of stakeholders. Our strategic plan will give us a clear focus for our future. And the next public school board meeting is March 15th. Live in Birmingham, I'm Megan Woods, Local 4. We'll be following it. Megan, we appreciate it. A senior high school shooting guard from our area was recently named for a finalist for a national basketball award. Not X's and O's, not for stats, but for something much bigger. Jamie Edmonds went to Oxford High School and introduces us to a courageous young man. It's game day for the Oxford Wildcats boys basketball team taking on Davison tonight in the district semifinals on the road. 
After everything the Wildcats have been through, there's comfort in returning to normalcy, returning to sports, just as senior John Asciutto wants it. It is pretty amazing. Senior John Asciutto is a man of few words, uncomfortable in the spotlight. On November 30th, the 17-year-old was thrust into a position he didn't ask for, shot in the leg inside his high school. Not wanting to relive that day, he tells us his focus is elsewhere. Honestly, I just love sports and I can't, like, I could not stand sitting at home. Like, when my leg, like, when I was sitting there on my leg and, like, everything, I was just like, no, nah, like, I got to be there and, like, I want to play it and it's just because I love it. As soon as he was able, John was back to basketball. Physically, I'm 100% a lot better back playing every day at practice with my, my boys and it's great. The reality is John has been through more than any high schooler should. It's why Oxford's athletic director, Tony DeMar, nominated John for the National Jersey Mike's Naismith High School Basketball Courage Award. When I thought of him and the courage that he's exemplified, um, it's immeasurable. I mean, there's, it's completely off the charts. The Atlanta Tip-Off Club, which administers the Naismith Awards, recently named Ashudo as one of 10 finalists out of hundreds of nominations. The executive director called John's and all of the Oxford community's courage beyond incredible. The female and male winner will be announced on April 12th. For Ashudo, it's not about individual awards. He would much prefer a team playoff win tonight. For sure, states in the playoffs. I'd turn the sword down for that any day. In Oxford, Jamie Edmonds, Local 4. Ashuto is actually a two-sport athlete. His plans for next year to go to a prep school and continue playing football.